everybody. Welcome to Economics with the Honorable David M. Walker. I'll be your moderator for today's show. And of course, in today's show, we're going to be looking at um, latest developments from Washington, D.C. And there has been some um, interesting changes that are in the news that the news isn't bringing up, which we're going to bring up on this show. A couple items. Number one, Argentina declared they have a budget surplus. And Argentina has had runaway inflation, but apparently they got their act together, something the United States has not done and have created a budget surplus. So we're gonna look at that on today's show. But number two, the most interesting thing that I see out there that the, the media isn't bringing up, politicians aren't bringing up, and we tend to ignore is this one. The interest on the debt now exceeds our largest budget item, the defense budget. Uh, this is a long-term, actually now a short-term problem that most of your tax dollars are going to one item, which is to pay interest on the national debt. And so with that, we're going to bring in uh, the person who is the expert on the national debt. You've seen him on the Pod TV channel. You've also seen him in Washington, D.C. on the Pod TV channel. We'll bring in the Honorable David M. Walker, the former Comptroller General of the United States. Uh, I don't know. This one, to me, is a shocker. Is this true? The first thing when I pick it up in the news, I go, is it true or memorize? Uh, interest on the debt exceeds the defense budget. Is this true, David? Are we in trouble? Well, first, Nick, it's true, but it's actually worse than what they want you to believe because the number that they're using is the net interest number. Now, let me explain what that means. Net interest means you don't count the interest that we're paying to the Social Security, Medicare, highway, and trust fund debt. You only count the interest that we're paying to debt held by the public. And so in reality, gross interest is over 20% higher than the number that they're reporting. Uh, and, and, uh, and yes, you know, this year net interest will pass the defense bu budget, but gross interest has already passed it. And, and you know, it's an, another example of this is how the six to seven trillion dollars in debt that's held by these trust funds that are guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, both as a principle and interest, guaranteed by the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, the federal government doesn't consider them to be a liability. Uh, and, you know, in my view, that's just dead wrong. I mean, you took the people's money, you spent the people's money, you replaced it with a bond that has all those guarantees. So we ought to be treating these trust funds as separate and distinct legal entities and account for them as separate and distinct legal entities uh, and be able to gross up the debt and gross up the interest on the federal government's financial statements. But, you know, government likes to keep bad numbers as low as they can, and they like to pump up good numbers. Uh, but nothing's new. Okay. Well, last thing that uh, was actually hit the Wall Street Journal this uh, last week is Japan's economy. They had the same problem that we did 34 years ago, where the national debt actually exceeded the 100% um, of their GDP. They went into an 80% decline and a 34-year slump. Is it possible that the United States of America becomes the next Japan and we enter in a three-decade slump because of the mis financial mismanagement? Well, you clearly, if you don't put your finances in order, you're going to have adverse economic growth implications over time. You're going to have adverse uh, implications in, in a variety of different uh, spillover effects. Uh, the ultimate irony is, Nick, is that, you know, the so-called modern monetary theory, that flawed and failed theory that says that you don't have to worry about deficits and debt as long as you can borrow in your own reserve currency, unless and until you have excess inflation, which newsflash we had, and therefore it's been abandoned appropriately, it never should have been started. We, it was followed in 2021, 2022. The irony is, is the, is the base case for the modern monetary theory was Japan. You know, Japan has, you know, public debt to GDP well over 200%, much higher than us. But what they don't want to talk about is they don't want to talk about the economic stagnation, they don't want to talk about the stagnation of, of the stock market. They don't want to talk about a number of the negative things. Just another example of how politicians and, uh, and biased economists, you know, want, want to cherry pick numbers uh, and, and, you know, just push the things that help make their case 
rather than provide a full, fair, and balanced view of what the true situation is. Okay. We, we, we have uh, two more items we want to discuss before we bring on our panelists. Um, this one I'm, I get tired of talking about, but maybe you don't. It's uh, the government shutdown again. In other words, apparently it's looming. And every time I see that, I go, what a waste of time, money, and effort. They shut down the government, then they bring it back, they pay everybody off, and business as usual. What are your thoughts about the, the looming government shutdown? Well, as Yogi Berra would say, it's deja vu all over again. And, uh, you know, th there are two continuing resolutions that are currently in effect. One continuing resolution is supposed to expire on March 1st, which is Friday. I think it's maybe maybe midnight on, you know, into Saturday. Uh, and the second one's supposed to expire a week later. The one that's supposed to expire this way year, this week is Agriculture FDA, Energy, Military Construction and Veterans Administration, and Transportation and HUD. And what ends up happening is if they're not funded or if there's not a new continuing resolution to extend it somewhat uh, further, uh, then the people in those departments that are not deemed to be essential cannot work. The people who are deemed to be essential have to work, but they don't get paid. Uh, and ultimately what ends up happening is it's incredibly disruptive. Uh, it ends up costing the government money because of penalties uh, and because you end up retroactively paying everybody, but you lose productivity uh, and, and a variety of other things. And here's the ultimate irony, Nick. The only people who are guaranteed to get paid in a government shutdown, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about I'm saying continue to get paid because remember I said before, essential workers in the executive branch have to work, but they don't get paid. The only persons that continue to get paid on time is the Congress. And the Congress is the one that caused the problem. So the truth is, is that we need fundamental bu budget reforms. You know, we ought to have automatic continuing resolutions if you don't pass, uh, if, you, if you don't pass the appropriations bills. We ought to have no budget, no pay, which means that if Congress doesn't pass certain bills on time, they don't get paid until they do. And here's key, no retroactive pay. Guess what? There are a few states that have done that, including California. And guess what? They've had things on time since then. So you have to align incentives, transparency, and accountability. And in the case of continuing resolutions, we're totally misaligned. Last thing I will say is, you know, we've talked about this before. The Congress has only passed all of the appropriations bills by the beginning of the fiscal year, which is October 1, four times in my lifetime. Four times in my lifetime. And the last time it happened was 1996. That is a F minus, not acceptable, Things need to change. Okay. Well, last thing about things need to cha change. I, I've heard about there's some new laws on fiscal responsibility uh, that is looming through Congress. Can you update? Is there anything, any movement uh, that we're seeing in the Congress on new laws on fiscal responsibility? Well, here's here's the key issue right now. Uh, the key issue is be, beyond the appropriations bills and, and the, a, a potential new CR extension if they don't pass all the appropriations bills. And I think it's virtually assured they're going to have to have a new continuing resolution, pump the ball again. And I think it's very possible, by the way, Nick, that they may end up having a CR for the whole year. Uh, I think that's still very possible. If that happens, they're going to have to have some across-the-board spending cuts based upon the Fiscal Responsibility Act that passed last summer. But the other issue that's going on with regard to fiscal issues in Washington is the, quote unquote, supplemental funding bill, the, quote unquote, emergency funding bill. And that is for Ukraine. Uh, that is for Israel, for Taiwan and for the border. As you know, a bill passed in the Senate, but it did not have adequate border <coughs> security provisions. And so therefore, it's not going to pass in the House. But the uh, but, but uh, Brian Fitzpatrick, who's the Republican chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus, 
uh, and his and his fellow members have proposed uh, a compromise bill that would provide uh, 49 billion, I think, roughly in funding for military only assistance for those three to those three entities, some for the border, but also has some tough border security provisions in it. So it is a bipartisan bill. It's intended to be a compromise. Uh, and I'm hoping that the speaker will allow a vote on it. And if the speaker doesn't allow a vote on it, they're trying to pursue what's called a discharge petition, where if you can get a majority of the members of the House, it doesn't even have to be bipartisan, but it would have to be in this circumstance to sign a discharge petition, then it automatically goes to the floor. Brian Fitzpatrick, who's a Republican from Pennsylvania, has said that he wants to allow amendments to the bill. Uh, but, you know, I think this is a worthwhile piece of legislation. I think it needs to be considered. But the thing that I've suggested is, look, you're not paying for any of this. You deem it to be an emergency. Well, the border is an emergency for us, but the borders for the other countries are an emergency for us, although we ought to help our allies. I would reinforce, though, that we don't have a defense treaty with any of these countries, although we should help our allies, uh, and, and I believe in that. Uh, c confined to military uh, aid, if you will. Uh, and, and so, you know, we'll have to see what happens. But, but you know, since they're not paying for it, I've said they ought to attach the Fiscal Commission Act to any related legislation, either to the supplemental bill or to an additional CR or appropriations bill. We've been kicking the count down the road too long. We need to start taking steps to deal with our large and growing financial sinkhole. And the way to do that is the Fiscal Commission Act, which has bipartisan support, has already passed the House Budget Committee, the speakers for it. And I think if it gets passed through the House, I think the Senate and the president will accept it. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to start bringing our panel. We do have uh, Rick Rosner coming in from Los Angeles. We have Kim Calhoun, who's right now on the stream with audio only. Uh, from from uh, Raleigh, has, it, has anybody in Congress uh, tried to bring a bill to the floor to say that if we don't fund the government, we don't get paid? Uh, uh, no <laughs> labels has been advocating this for several years, and so have I. Uh, and uh, you know, it may it may have been introduced at some point in time in the past. You know how many bills are introduced every year. I mean, just because you introduce a bill doesn't. Mean, yeah. I don't. It, I don't think it's ever been subject to a hearing. Uh, needless to say, uh, it's not something that uh, most of the members would be excited about. Uh, it, it is something that could get done, but you have to keep in mind the twenty fifth amendment. No, the twenty seventh amendment. The twenty seventh amendment says. If you're gonna if you're gonna change congressional pay, it needs to be for the next Congress. All right. Yeah. And so therefore, if it was to happen, they'd have to pass legislation that would not be effective until the next Congress. Well, that's okay. You know, same thing with regard to term limits. If we end up doing term limits, that's gonna have to be through a constitutional amendment. And it'd be a small price to pay to say, okay, the clock on the amount of time you can be in starts once the amendment's adopted which means that people might be able to stay in, you know, for another, let's say, 12 years, uh, potentially. But on the other hand, we solve the problem long term. You know, sometimes you have to compromise in order to get things done. It's not a bad word, but unfortunately, a lot of people in Washington think it is. So Nick's been talking about how we're kind of screwed with the with uh, interest on the debt and that the way to fix it is to reduce spending, to increase tax revenue, and I'd say also to, to increase growth. So what's, and Nick says we've got a, we're likely to have a bad future. What's the best case set of circumstances that'll get us out of where we're at? Well, first, every major federal agency that is, has anything to do with fiscal and monetary policy has said for several years, that we're on an imprudent and unsustainable fiscal path because debt to GDP is growing faster than the economy. And now our fastest growing expense in the federal government is interest for which you get nothing. Uh, you know, my, my view is that uh, if you're proficient at math, 
and I know you are, Rick, and I think Nick and I are as well. Uh, you know, there's no way you can grow your way out of this problem. Uh, you know, the math just doesn't come close to working. Do we want more growth? Absolutely. And there are a number of things that we can and should do in order to stimulate more growth, including, uh, you know, including devolution, following federalism principles, including, uh, you know, regulatory relief, uh, including, uh, most importantly, putting our finances in order. Because if you don't put your finances in order, uh, it's going to be a drag on growth and, and a variety of other things. And in the end, we're going to have to do three things. We're going to have to take steps to grow the economy. We are focusing on debt to GDP, trying to get the denominator to grow faster than the numerator. We're going to have to reform social insurance programs to, to make them solvent, sustainable, secure. We're going to have to reprioritize and reduce discretionary, projected discretionary spending, including defense. Uh, and we're going to have to engage in comprehensive tax reform that will generate more revenues as a percentage of GDP. We're going to have to do all three. Now, the public in general believes that the, the problem is more of a spending problem than it is a revenue problem, that that you probably you know need about two to three to one spending reduction for every part revenue. Uh, and I think from a political standpoint, that's probably where you're going to have to be in order to get a bipartisan solution. I mean, a, you know, a lot of conservatives don't want any revenue increases. A lot of uh, a lot of progressives don't want any spending reductions. They don't. They're living in a dream world, uh, and they yep. would, they would probably fail math. But in the end, the other thing that we, we need a commission in order to get that to happen, and then the other thing that we're going to have to have that we've talked about before is we're going to have to have a constitutional amendment because that's the only thing that can bind current and future Congress. What that's does it take to do, David? What does it take? This is Steve Brown. I'm in Raleigh at a meeting. I did, I'm okay. doing this outside of my. What does it take to get a constitutional amendment in the U.S.? Well, here's where we are, my friend. Here's where we are. There's two ways to get a constitutional amendment. The okay. old-fashioned way, two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate pass a, an identical proposed amendment. They send it to the states. Three-quarters of the states have to ratify. Here's the deal. Okay. By the way, I was with your attorney general this past week for a few minutes in Washington. Here's oh, the deal. I was the with second, him last night. The second way is if two-thirds of the states, 34, file an application with the Congress for a convention of states to propose one or more amendments, then the Congress has a express, enumerated, ministerial, non-discretionary responsibility to call the convention. In 1979, we had 39. In 1983, we had 40, including North Carolina both times. And Congress never did anything. And so now I and a few people are pursuing to get the states to sue the Congress oh. failure to discharge. We have two states that have agreed to do it. And now we're looking for two more, two more. And that's one of the reasons I talked to your attorney general. I'd like for New Jer I'd like for North Carolina to be. Well, part he's going to be our, he's going to be our governor in a uh, seven months. So we're excited well, he, about that. I, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. So, so my point is, is that, you know, we we need the states need to step up and assert their rights. Right. The rights have been trampled on. It's time to correct that wrong. Well, I've been getting some questions. At, I'm just here to listen to David Walker. I've been getting some questions about whether, if Trump were elected, he could amend the Constitution to stay there forever. But I don't think so. It sounds like it's going to take. It, it, there's a process involved. So, for those of you there's out there worried no about that, that, that's going to happen. I mean, people also forget he was already president once. I mean, yeah. it's not like. It's not, it's not like this guy's an unknown guy, you know? Yeah. I mean, that, you know, yeah. that, that's all fear yeah. tactics. I mean, here's, yeah. here's what I, th here's what I think is going to happen. Tell me where I'm wrong. Okay. But the U S doesn't get its act together. And within 10, 20 years, uh, China dominates the world, takes over the position that we had maybe with <laughs> India in second place. Yeah, I think the India is going to be dominant. So India, I mean, and then the U.S., you know, no longer dominant, but like one of those countries that used to rule the world, like England, like the Roman Empire, still a pretty nice place to live in or visit, just not the world's, you know, number one country anymore. Where am I wrong? Yeah. Well, Rick, uh, well, well, Rick uh, first, the United States is uh, number one in nominal GDP, but but... But China passed us 
is number one in purchasing power parity GDP. The United States has the strongest military on earth, but China's catching up quickly. Uh, the United States is now number two in diplomatic missions around the world. China is number one. Uh, you know, China, uh, you know, is it actually has been passed by India in the largest population, okay? Uh, and as you recall, there's a book that's about ready to be reissued in, in an updated version called America in 2040 called Still a Superpower, and I happen to know the author of that book. Uh, and basically, it's posed as a question because the truth is, the answer is yes if you follow the advice in the book, and the answer is no if you don't. In part, learning lessons from history, learning from learning from Rome, learning from the United Kingdom, learning right. from other great powers that have existed in the past that strayed. Uh, we're not we're going to be a great power, but but we're not going to be as dominant as we have been. Yeah, uh, and if we don't put our finances in order, uh, we're going to have economic, national security, and domestic tranquility problems. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Okay. David, I listened to you on uh, the Pod TV network on television, on Roku, and you're, you have your testimony before the U.S. Congress, which I found quite interesting. But what really kind of knocked me out a little bit was uh, your statement of this. The United States is really 125.3 trillion in debt. Ooh. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that well, that's statement? A creative, that's a creative way to spell debt. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, it's just because there's so many, so many zeros you had an extra E, right? <laughs> so, here, here's the deal, okay? Uh, the government likes to use the, the, the smallest numbers that it can when it's bad news, okay? One example is, it likes to talk about debt held by the public rather than debt subject to the debt seat. The difference is the, the bonds that are in the so-called trust fund. It likes to talk about GDP, but only focus on debt held by the public rather than total debt subject to the debt saving limit. It, you know, it likes to talk uh, about balance sheet liabilities, which, by the way, doesn't include the intergovernmental debt and doesn't include unfunded social insurance insurance obligations like Social Security and Medicare. So if you look at the financial statements of the U.S. government and, and you look at the total liabilities, which includes the debt, but it also includes unfunded civilian and military pensions, retiree health care, trillions of dollars, and then various other miscellaneous liabilities. And then if you add that to the unfunded social insurance obligations, it's over $120 trillion. So the bottom line is, is everybody talks about the 34 trillion ice that's above the water line, like in an iceberg. But as you know, in an iceberg, the most of the mass is below the water line. Uh, and in this case, it's the same thing. Most of the mass for the federal government is not on the balance sheet. And that's why I've advocated for accounting reforms to where we treat these intergovernmental bonds as liabilities. We treat the trust funds as separate, distinct legal entities. We have a double bottom line where we show the net before social insurance and then the net after social insurance. We have much more disclosures about military equipment with regard to number and condition rather than what we paid for it, which is not really relevant. And then we have a lot more disclosures about tax preferences. We have $1.7 trillion in tax preferences. That's backdoor spending. You know, that needs to be subject to the same type of review and reconsideration as regular spending. And it's not. Yeah. And by the way, it, it's mandatory, too. By the way, when you consider direct mandatory spending, which is social insurance, interest and other programs and tax expenditures, the one point seven trillion, which is also mandatory because that continues absent a change in law. The federal government only controls about 15% of spending. We've written a blank check for 85% of spending. What the heck kind of budget is that? So do we get idiocracy? If you've seen the movie, do we get a bunch of people living in, in squalor and then old people tended to by crappy robots if we don't get it together? <laughs> well, I, 
personally, I, I'm not worried about my generation. I'm worried about my grandkids' generation. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and that, and, and this fight for me is about country kids and grandkids, and it's about stewardship. It's about not just leaving things better off, but better position for the future. And, and, and my generation is not doing that right now. Uh, and, and now with career yeah. politicians who are focused on getting reelected, focused on living for today rather than helping to create a better tomorrow, uh, our problems are increasing and compounding. Yeah. I mean, this is really there any, any thoughts on immigration? Because it looks to me when I'm looking at the number one area that people are looking to vote on in this upcoming election, it isn't the national debt. It's like they don't care about being totally fiscally irresponsible. It's not a concern. But it's immigration. Is there a way we can create the immigration policy in the United States to actually favor economic growth as opposed yeah, to... Yeah, well, well, first, I've seen a, n a number of polls, including polling we do for no labels, uh, you know, and you know, um, the, the top two issues are, not necessarily in this order, border security and immigration <clears throat> Uh, and the economy, which includes inflation and fiscal responsibility. Uh, th those are the top two issues, okay? Mm -hmm. And concerns about the debt have increased significantly uh, in, in recent months, all right? Um, first, you have to have border security. Do we need comprehensive immigration reform? Absolutely, we need comprehensive. But that's no excuse not to secure the border. Uh, and, and so the first thing we need to do is we need to secure the border. On immigration reform, well, we ought to learn from others. You know, we ought to look at what's the macroeconomic needs of the country and what are the demographics realities of the country. And let me clarify what I mean by that. We, we the only reason this country is growing right now is because of immigration, because our birth rate now is about two to one, uh, two, two, two children for every, uh, for every woman. That doesn't give you a replacement because of mortality that occurs uh, in life. Uh, and so as a result, the only reason the country is growing is because of immigration. Do we need immigration? Absolutely, positively, yes. But we need intelligent immigration. We need immigration based upon what the economic needs of our country are. Uh, and, and in that regard, we have to, you know, we have to also differentiate between a pathway to citizenship and a pathway to legal status, meaning green card, we also have to differentiate between issuing temporary work permits uh, and, uh, and, and long-term uh, rights to be in, in the country. So, the, you know, there are ways to deal with this that are reasoned, reasonable, and should be able to get bipartisan support. At the same point in time, we're going nowhere fast until you secure the border. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And I, I just want to do a quick follow up to this, um, even though Dave's our chief guest. I think that uh, so well put by David Walker. And, and I speak a lot about immigration in North Carolina. And let me tell you that the, the, the side of immigration where we need to get it right is the legal immigration. Many are on from India, China on H-1Bs. They're studying in our universities. They're creating companies. Uh, there's a demand for labor. If you look at market demand in terms of tech jobs, many new jobs being created in AI, cybersecurity, robotics, and also the green economy. We forget that over 2 million jobs just since the Inflation Reduction Act passed, where you can leverage some of these skills. The fact of the matter is, you know, we often forget 44% of the Fortune 500 were started by immigrants. So you wouldn't have a Zoom, you wouldn't have a Google, you wouldn't have a Yahoo, you wouldn't have all these companies if you didn't have immigrants. So we're losing them to other nations like Canada, right? So you got to get that down right. But David Walker's right. You can't have, you know, 10,000 migrants coming in the border um, costing New York, for example, $20 billion. So it's going to take Democrats and Republicans coming together to figure out how do you have the legal immigration piece, which is stamping a visa on an entrepreneur that wants to come here, uh, getting providing education-based exemptions, allowing spouses to work in between uh, the work. In Morrisville, I'm seeing I've got four requests already from high school kids being deported to India next week because their parents aged out of the system, what's called documented dreamers. They're freaking out. They don't know what to do. This is a real problem. So these families are just moving back to India. One of them runs a $100 million company. 
and he's going to go create it in M Mumbai now uh, because uh, he said, I can't afford to do it here. So uh, there's going to be a brain drain occurring. And make no mistake, the prime minister of India is welcoming, welcoming them with open arms. And, and Narendra Modi is even telling people like John Chambers that, hey, you know, India is going to be the startup nation of the, of, the country, of the world. And, you know, just last year, India had 87 unicorns, billion dollar companies, which is unheard of in a nation that just four years ago only had about a handful of startups. So just think, right? Anyway, we're in agreement. Over my time. We're in yeah. agreement. We, yeah. yeah. Yes. Modi, 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 Modi said he's going to beat America. I mean, you know, he's, he said he, he wants to be the number one startup nation in the world. And, and I think this prime minister is on his way to making it happen. And Canada as well. So I, I looked it up. The U.S. birth rate is 1.64 births per women. Since guys can't have babies, uh, women have to do the work. And so every woman needs to have two babies to replace the population. We're at 1.64. So no, we're, we're, we would lose population if it weren't for immigration. We're four percent of the world's population. We need to be the country that that sucks the the best and brightest out of the remaining ninety six percent of the world. Yeah, that's a twenty twenty yeah. number, so it's four years old. But I but, it, yeah. but the, the problem the problem is the same. We our birth rate has declined dramatically. The only reason the country is growing is because of immigration. We need immigration, but we need to fundamentally reform our, immigra our immigration policies to recognize the economic and demographic realities of the world. Uh, Nick, I'll let you call on people. You can yeah, I'll yeah, be next, then Kim and Mark. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm here to listen. Take care, Steve. We'll see no, you. I'm right, here. Steve. I'm going to listen. It's great to see Kimberly okay. Gallant. I'm, I'm, I'm not driving, by the way, guys. I'm in the car. <laughs> okay. Let me see. Yeah, so yeah. so with with I immigration, <laughs> the, my thing is why are why are when are we going to be honest about immigration? We always talk about the fluff and the easy low hanging fruit of oh well we can't have ten thousand people coming to the we can't have ten thousand migrants coming to the border or oh we got to secure the border. Well, a lot of people are trying to come through the port. The, the drugs are coming through the ports of entry. So we got to secure the border there. That's where the actual uh, crimes take place. The individuals coming to the border have been sitting in line. The lines that we tell them to sit there, a lot of them are coming, have been sitting for two and three years and cannot wait anymore. They're struggling as they are. So we don't look at the actual causes and the reasons that these individuals are coming. And yes, we have to we have to look at our immigration laws, which which I'm so glad, Dave, you, you talked about that, because that's that's truthfully where our problem is. When we talk about securing the border, uh, that's fluff. That's low hanging fruit. But we need to focus on. You know, we got to we got to increase the ability to give pathways for these individuals to come through when people are sitting in three years in Mexico City trying to get through the border, but they can't. That shouldn't happen. We should we should have more people. Uh, for example, I'm having to deal with that on my personal end and knowing how crazy the whole immigration process is and how expensive it is and how if you miss a date then you're truly screwed. And a lot of people also, on top of that, a lot of the people that Steve was talking about, they end up overstaying their welcome. And that's where a lot of the <laughs> undocumented immigrants come from. So therefore, when are we going to be honest about it and stop demonizing the people that have been waiting? And the majority of the immigrant popula population has a, has a lower crime rate than native born Americans. But we know we always demonize them saying they're bringing drugs. No, they're not. They're not at all. Well, mo most of them are, but but and you're right that there's a lot of drugs coming in through the ports of entry. But there are a lot of drugs coming, you know. But yeah. that's, but we cannot say that that's the immigrants doing that. No, 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 no. We that, are a country, our we're country, country that's also, dependent upon also. those drugs as well, and we cause a lot of that problem. Well, yeah, we have the demand, but the cartels yeah. control the border beyond the ports of entry. Okay, I mean that's uh, that's a reality. Look, here's here's the cold hard truth, uh, and even the, the Department of Homeland Security has admitted this: eighty to ninety percent of the people who are trying to come to the United States are trying to come here for economic opportunity, not because they're fle fleeing oppression. Okay, 
So 80 to 90 percent who are trying to come here would not qualify to be able to come here. All right. And yet we have millions that are in that category that have come across the border. And if you look at the differences in the border, California doesn't even guard the border. I mean, they don't have yeah. any guards on the border at all. Plus, they're a sanctuary state. All right. Uh, and they're providing you know, health care, they're providing housing, they're providing a variety of things, which obviously just encourages more people to come. So my view is, look, we need more immigrants, but we have to be intelligent about what kind of immigrants do we need. We need immigrants who will have an opportunity, who can contribute to society, not immigrants who are going to be a drain on our already overtaxed, uh, not overtaxed, our overstressed, social safety net, you know, I mean, and so that's, that's the issue. I mean, and, and I do Kim, Kim, the station that's not Kim. appropriate. I agree with you. And, and, I, and I want to say uh, hello to everyone and thank you for this um, just invigorating conversation. And David, I, I have one real big question for you here about um, what you were discussing in the beginning of all of this. Um, why is it that Congress today is allowed to make laws or even do business with companies of which their lawmaking positions influence their profits and pockets. Why are we allowing, this was never allowed in the beginning. This was written in law that this should not happen, but everything they do, just like what you said, when they take a vacation, as I call it, they decide, oh, we're going to shut down government. The only people who get uh, paid are them. So I want to know, and, and then if they do shut down, we need to go in and just take over the positions and tell them not to come back anymore. We are the government, David. We are the government. They're supposed to be serving us, not the other way around. People well, with money are the government right now. With Citizens Robert. United, yeah, the, the people with a ton of money, corporations, people who can make political contributions get to determine what happens politically. Yeah, well, and that's yeah, not exactly. how the laws are written, and that's what I'm asking David. Well, I know okay. how it has turned out. I know our outcome, but David, how has this happened, and why can't we change it? Well, first, the first three words in the Constitution are the most important, we the people. We the people are responsible and accountable for what does or does not happen. However, we are a republic, not a direct democracy. Uh, we, we are a representative uh, democracy, uh, which means that we elect people to represent us. We do not have the right for a uh, federal referendum. Some countries do, including Switzerland, which uh, you know passed uh, a, a constitutional amendment uh, for fiscal responsibility with over 80% support because they they submitted a referendum and it got done. Okay, uh, you know we don't have that in our country. We have we have. We have way too many people who view political office as a career rather than as temporary public service. We have a campaign finance system that unduly empowers very wealthy people, corporations, unions, who in many cases can't vote in the elections that they're spending money on. One example is uh, Zuckerberg spent over $400 million dollars on get out to vote efforts in the last election and there was no restrictions on them being able to do that. So we're going to have to have a constitutional amendment that deals with campaign finance as well. And I'm involved with a yeah. group called, uh, called uh, Amer uh, America's Promise, uh, who has a, a, an intelligent amendment in that regard that would give the Congress the ability to regulate if they wanted to and would give the state legislatures the ab ability to regulate if they want to. But it's not a one size fits all. It doesn't tell them they have to do anything. But right now, because of the Supreme Court decision, it's going to take, uh, you know, a constitutional amendment in order to be able to give that authority uh, to, to uh, the, the federal government and the states. So Absolutely. we need lots of reforms. OK, I mean, you know, we're 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 not headed in a positive direction uh, and we need a major course. correction. Okay. I'm going to end on that before I leave, but I mean, that's just such a great point that David's made. And, and Kimberly, I tell you, as someone that lives it and breathes it, both on the elected side, but being in governmental relations, I tell you, 
it's all about access now, right? The people that raise the money for the politicians have the access and they then can leverage that access uh, for their clients, right? And or their agendas. And so it's not about we the people anymore. And the long I've been going to DC now once a month for the past two years, sometimes twice a month. And I've never seen Washington so sold out. And so even though, you know, uh, Jake Tapper is doing the, uh, you know, um, uh, United States of Scandal, right? He did Blagojevich uh, last week. I uh, did John Edwards uh, the, this yes, last night. But the bottom line is that, you know, bribery is really existing today, right? It's just they don't come out and say it. Well, I give you $8,000 or $20,000 or $400,000. And then when I come in with a client or I come in with a thing, you're going to give me what I need. And, and also it takes... You know, you're trying to string policies, so you got to have enough Republicans in your pocket. You got to have some Democrats in your pocket. The best lobbyists are coming out with coalitions. What I've noticed, even when you're le- dealing with foreign governments wh- who have lobbyists. So let's not forget China, maybe not so much, but you know, India, Israel. They're gonna they're gonna pay sometimes thirty, forty thousand dollars a month for lobbyists. Um, remember how Hunter Biden got in trouble doing the deal in Ukraine, right? So anyway, it's pay to play. Uh, and Kimberly, I think the only way it's going to stop is like what David said, a constitutional amendment um, or just accept this is the way it is. And we just we don't call it for what it is. And we don't call it out. Right. I mean, but it's, but it's don't terrible. we have laws in place that Congress is not supposed to be making laws that um, their positions influence their profits? Don't we have laws? They'll always, yeah, yeah, we, we don't. We have we have ethics rules. Oh, OK, but one of the biggest, rules. but one of the one of the biggest jokes. Uh, in Washington is the ethics committees in the House and the Senate because they police themselves. Understand this. The, the way I always look at things is there's three levels, okay? Level one and the floor of behavior is the law. That is the lowest thing. It is the, the minimal accepted. Above that is ethics and above that is morality, okay? So we have too many people in this country, especially in politics on both sides of the aisle, that will argue, well, it's not illegal, but it may be unethical and it may be immoral. And so you shouldn't do it. All right. Mm-hmm. So we don't have laws that prohibit, uh, for example, members of Congress and members of their family who invest in stocks and other types of investments where they may have benefited by having inside information. OK, yeah. um, or their laws influenced it. Now, what they do, what they do have is they have disclosure requirements. But just like the SEC and Nick, you're still on, right? Yeah, he he's, is. A, he's on, but he's in the back. But he's no, and the labor department, everybody. I'll see all right. Take week. care. And the labor department with regard to fiduciary to- responsibility. Disclosure is not enough right. just because you disclose something doesn't mean that it's acceptable, nor does it mean it's legal. And so we yeah. need to toughen up, toughen up the laws w- with regard to this. So but, so in, in the trading yeah. stock situation, you know, there I don't know that there's a policy that says how far in advance that they're supposed to disclose what they're trading in. But there was a group of young men who built an AI tool that scans the Internet for their trades and they follow their trades and they've made millions doing it. Yeah. So um, and they said it's all they, the reason why they did this was it was based on the unethics of our Senate and our Congress making trades out there with by and, and making the laws to influence the profits from their trades. And that's why they did that. And, you know, now they're getting in a little bit of a trouble for doing that. But they're just following the tales, coattails of our crooked government. That's and it. That's all, that's, and that's all after the fact. Yeah, that's all after the fact. After the fact. Hey, Dave, Mark, just really yeah, I had my hands up. Uh, I actually had Nick kind of dismissed it earlier, but as I was telling him um, at one of the cultural centers I work at, they were showing a film about land loss and all along this uh, line. So if you've not seen the film, check it out. It's called Gaining Ground and all in that space. But the lady that is the head of land loss prevention, I think that, I think that's still her title, Savvy Horn, was talking about something that I've heard you talk about mm-hmm. as well. And Nick kind of dismissed the idea, but she was concerned, one, about the government taking some of the land, which they have definitely been documented, the USDA and other things and gentrification. But she was also concerned about the amount of land 
that China owns and everything, because apparently China owns about 380,000 acres of land here in the United States. So I was just wondering your thoughts around that, because Savvy Horn brought that up, and a lot of people will be surprised. This is a relatively liberal woman. I would say she's probably a Democrat and everything, but she was bringing up something that a lot of Republicans have brought up as well. But I just wanted your take on that, because even when I brought it up earlier, a lot of people were dismissing this idea that there's a lot of land that the Chinese government owns that is our land, whether it's here in North Carolina or in a number of other places, but you were in government and a comptroller general. I just wanted your take on that. And then I've got a quick question about no labels as well, but I did want your quick take on that. Well, China thinks strategically and long-term mm -hmm. and they have a strategic plan that focuses on economic, demo demographic, um, diplomatic, military, and cultural perspectives. Uh, and that, that plan includes a desire to try to obtain uh, access to or ownership of properties uh, and rights. Uh, and one of the things that they've done, <coughs> they're trying to obtain access to food production mm -hmm. land, uh, in the United States. And in many cases, what they're trying to also do is to have that land have a double benefit not only be land that can be helpful in producing food product, but also land that might be uh, close to uh, strategic military facilities. So they get a double benefit out of it. This is just another example of, you know, uh, of how they think strategically and long-term. Uh, and it's also an example of how, you know, we have a pretty open society, you know, and, and you know, we don't have as many restrictions on what others can and can't do. I will tell you that there are states, including, I think, Florida, okay, um, and I think South Dakota, who have passed legislation that precludes, uh, you know, the purchase of, uh, of U.S. land uh, in certain circumstances. And I think that this has really recently come to light within the last year, uh, and I think it's going to get more attention as as, as as we look as we go forward. Mark, did you say China owns three hundred and eighty thousand acres? Yes. So the U.S. has two point four three billion acres. So China owns about one six thousandth of the U.S. land, um, which isn't nothing, but it's. Well, the, the key is, is that where, what's the strategic significance of it? Yeah, from a materiality standpoint, Rick, you're right, okay? It, it's not material. But the real question is, what kind of land and where is it? And that was the point that Savvy wanted, that, that was the point that Savvy was making was the nature of the land. She was actually, like I said, this is not a conservative in the, the least sense of the word, but she was definitely making that argument that it is something that folks need to be concerned about. And she wasn't even dismissing the gentrification part of the conversation and the USDA. So she definitely laid some of the feet at the uh, gov U.S. government as well. But she definitely did point out some of the things going on with China and it's uh, obtaining some of this land and everything. I did have one other quick question for you that sounded separate from that. And I had brought it up on the news earlier and everything the world edition but i would love to hear your thoughts as you are one of the founders of no label and everything and i've heard some people speculating that the reason that nikki ellie is standing the race and the reason that dean phillips is involved is because they are potential no label candidates and everything and i've even heard some people say that they've heard the rumblings of this and i was just wondering as one that is involved in that space if that is possibly the reason that she is staying in and it is uh, some of those conversations actually taking place because i've heard that that's part of the reason that she may be staying in the races that she may be looking at a third party candidacy and you folks that were, are with no labels may be looking at her as a potential candidate well first we're looking at several potential candidates uh, we will not make a decision on whether or not we're going to offer our line uh, to a unity ticket until after Super Tuesday. Uh, and and we, we won't announce the decision and who the ticket would be before March 14th for a variety of reasons. Right. Uh, the two people that you have mentioned are, you know, among people that, you know, should be considered. But here's the big footnote. Uh, there's something called sore loser laws. Mm -hmm. And over half the states have sore loser laws. Now, what are sore loser laws? Sore loser laws say that if you run for the nomination of a major political party, uh, 
uh, and do not get that nomination, then you cannot run as an independent and be on the ballot. It, you know, in other words, that that's why it's called sore loser. You didn't get you didn't get the nomination, so you can't do an in run and say, okay, now I want to run as an independent, or I want to run some some other way. Uh, and so one of the things that you know that that uh, for the same office. And so for somebody like uh, Phillips, you know, if, if he was running for president, he could be considered for vice president without violating the sore loser law. Same thing for Nikki Haley. But if Nikki Haley uh, or Dean Phillips wanted to be considered for uh, the top spot for no labels, they have to, you know, you have to determine whether or not that's even viable because of the sore loser laws. Okay. Are those sore, sore loser laws legal? They've been challenged in court. I, it, it just strikes me that this. You know, the answer is yeah, how much? How long is it going to take to be able to do that? Right? I mean, you know, yeah. I, I mean, you know, you might argue they're unconstitutional or something, but this this Supreme Court's not going to consider. You got an election in November, right? So, so the real issue is is that you know that is a big big question mark uh, that I know that No Labels is taking a further deep look at. Uh, but ironically, the longer she stays in, the bigger the problem. And candidly, no matter what you think of Nikki Haley, I don't know why she's staying in because she's got no prayer of getting the Republican nomination. Um, she does have one if if one of them dies, right? No, um, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. She has alienated herself from the Trump delegates. And the Trump and look, I'm not a Trump fan. You know that, okay? I know. But 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 the Trump delegates will decide who the nominee will be, and it won't be Nikki Haley. Even if even even if Trump falls out, there are plenty of other people they would consider that they prefer to Nikki Haley. So I don't know why she's doing what she's doing, but that's her business. Well, well maybe, maybe she's Dave, you're spot on. Agenda, but I think it's a sad country that we live in that we have to make no uh, no sore loser laws and you know emphasize ethics in our government and, and emphasize um ethics that are just it is it's just pathetic that we have to start laying at ground the ethics but a no sore loser well, where's sasha when i need him this doesn't happen in other countries right so it's just it's it's um crazy it's crazy just, I didn't I mean, even know they had such crazy laws out there in certain states. No, no loser laws, but um, well, know. look at Hawaii making a bill right now so that they can eminent domain more land. And you know, I've been looking at the conspiracy theories on some of this, you know, because all of those uh, rich people who got the PPP loans that and Congress and senators who waived their own right to have to pay it back, right? They don't have to pay it back, so they got to keep the money. Now they're instituting eminent domain laws so that they can come in and do land grabbing according to some of the people. So they feel like that the rich man is going to keep land grabbing and buying up the land so that they can rent back to the middle class, hardworking middle class, rather than let them buy it so that now we become a renter's nation. And this, this David, was a prediction of what the future is going to be like for our children and grandchildren is they will only be able to afford and it'll be so expensive that they will never get out of the debtor prison that we're being put into. Uh, uh, which, what, what, what middle class are you discussing? Uh, there is no middle class in the United States anymore. Kind of well, it's, it's not going to exist here real soon because nobody wants to be middle class working for the rich man and sustaining the poor man and yeah, you know when you no talk problem. about the 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 um you know the amount of babies being born every year um they tried to increase that by with pro-lifers but nobody takes care of the babies after they're born and one of the problems i have with that is the only person liable for the cost of having that baby is the mother and there are a lot of single mothers out there with the debt so hanging heavily weigh, weighing on them after they give birth that they can't even afford to go out and work because their wages are garnished for giving birth. And none of that debt was put on the daddy of the baby. Yeah, well, so that's, 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 I've witnessed this more than once. 
This is not a one-time situation. I've talked to a lot of girls about this. It is a totally unfair situation. So there's a lot of problems out there and nobody's doing anything about it except making the rich man richer. Well, that's clearly an effort. Let me mention one thing real quickly and then Rick and Jatobi, I think, had it. What is the largest asset on the balance sheet of the federal government? Student debt. The president wants to give it away. Well, he gave away the PPP loan and it was yeah. free. So, I mean, so, it, it was higher than the student debt. And 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 millions no, of, of congressmen no, no, and senators no, benefited. No, that is $1.7 trillion. Well, I, I still no. think the PPP loan should have never been waived. Oh, I understand what you're saying. No, there, there was huge waste, huge waste with regard to let uh, Toby say a thing. Yeah, well, I was just going to say the student loan is one of the biggest things that's holding actually individuals from actually getting over. I mean, if you take, for example, right now, any student loan that you're paying back, you're not actually paying back that $60,000 that you borrowed. You're paying back the interest $300,000 $300, in interest. So that sixty that, that is a $240,000 increase in interest that you're paying. That's actually what's being forgiven. And that's what's on the balance sheets is the actual grabbing that these banks and the Navients and the other uh, for-profit industries that are actually taking advantage of these individuals who cannot pay these, these loans back. They sit there and we, we, we talk about financial literacy. We talk about, uh, you know, uh, trying to uh, get out of debt and everything. Well, student loans really do need to be forgiven in a lot of ways because you have these for-profit industries, these for-profit schools that take advantage. And we want to this economic machine, the biggest investment. And, you know, this Dave, the biggest investment uh, biggest return on investment is always in education and everything else comes after that. Real, real, real quickly, I have no problem in student ro uh, loan relief that is based upon rendering service that benefits society. But giving it away for doing nothing, I think, is unacceptable. But, and so Dave has, has all these things that America needs to do to get on the right track. Right. Right. But the trouble is, this is our third consecutive presidential election with candidates that people don't want to line up behind. People liked Obama. They wanted to get behind him. People like George W. Bush wanted to get behind him. They liked Reagan. You need you get more done when you have a charismatic candidate who can kind of pull the country together. And we are very unpulled together. I think we're stuck in a position, though, even with the two bad can even with the two candidates that nobody likes. I mean, even when we had, you know, the people, the half the country loved Trump and still there was a lot of things that did not get done. Half the country loved Obama. There was still a lot of things that did not get done. I think what we get trapped in is these personalities and these ideas. And right now, honestly, I do appreciate Biden being like what we want in a referee where he's not out front and in front of everybody 24 seven and telling me this and that and the other thing, I want him doing stuff in the background, but it's tough right now with a Congress that has only passed 34 pieces of legislation. Two of them were memorial thing. So if you can't, it, it, we need a bigger balance on, okay, if Biden had a Congress that could work with him, then I think there would be a lot more done. And it's the same thing. Well, I can't really say with Trump because there was a lot of legislation that went through after that. But right now, 39 pieces of legislation is not getting anything done. We can. It, 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 so right now that's falling on the Republican Party. And honestly, no labels doing a good thing of trying to go to the center of the Republican Party and moving more people out, out that way, which is a good thing. <laughs> because I think we need balance because in all honesty, not all Democrats have all the answers. Not all Republicans have all the answers. We need that centrist mindset. Yeah, and, and so all, it'd be nice all, to have, all, you know, that 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 Republican Party that was sensible again, that we could work with, because well, I think there's... All honesty, we're we need center on both way. on both parties. Center on both parties. We're yeah. going to have to see you next week on economics with the Honorable David M. Walker. We're out of time. Until next Take week. Have a good. Good. Good.